Right, hello again, everyone. Uh, so it's time for second session now on uh, stage A at EMF 2016. And uh, we're continuing on the subject of video games. And I'm happy to introduce Catherine Flick, who's going to be talking to us about morality in video games. So, um, yeah, take it away, Catherine. Thanks. Well, thanks very much. It's uh, always a pleasure to come to these sorts of things because it's much more interesting than talking to my students. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> um, I'm uh, here today to talk to you about ethics in video games. Um, and uh, this is because this is basically one of the things that I do. Um, my boss calls it my hobby research, so um, I really like my hobbies. Um, so anyway, I thought I'd come and talk to you a little bit about uh, kind of a bit of the st state of the art's a difficult word for this sort of thing because it's a bit of a mixture of philosophy, sociology, um, what I like to call responsible innovation, uh, and also um, just straight up kind of good old fashioned uh, gameplay and fun with games and stuff like that. Um, but I would like to say that I am theoretically, I, I, I'd like to call myself a, um, a computer ethicist, a technology ethicist, and one of my specific areas of interest is in video games and ethics. Um, uh, often the word ethics tends to make people go a bit, uh, what does that like, um, am I doing the wrong thing and, and all this. I'm not here to judge anybody. Um, I don't like judging people. I think that's kind of not what my role is. What my role is as an ethicist is to get you thinking about your own behavior and how you interact with people and how you design games that and interact with people because the thing about society and technology is that we create technology but technology has a significant influence on us and our society as a whole. So it's really important that we get this, this sort of loop working in a nice forward progressive way um, and that's where the ethics kind of comes in uh, rather than perhaps potentially a uh, toxic environment type way as the previous uh, talk speaker was um, discussing. So um, actually I really liked that previous talk because I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that were in that as well but not on quite the same detailed level but it all works into this magical thing. So um, you when you play a game you are you never just play a game you never just sit down and play a game you are actually an ethical agent because you're a thinking, uh, feeling human being, and you are acting within a particular socio-cultural uh, um, uh, within context. I wrote contact there, but I meant context <laughs> that interacts with a particular simulation, which is the game. And therefore, this simulation and the interaction with this simulation can actually have a significant effect upon you. Uh, there's the direct interaction that you have with the game, so the actual mechanics of the game, uh, and that's you as pl the player of the game, so the, the mechanical interactions the play. Then there's a higher level decision making about what it is that you do in the game that's based on your socio-cultural background, your upbringing, who you have as friends, uh, your education, your, you know, whether you like Leicester City or Manchester United, all these little tiny things kind of all influence you in your, um, uh, your higher level decision making about you, you, that makes you up you as an ethical agent. Agent. So uh, to use some examples at the extreme ends of these sorts of ranges in, in, in terms of games that actually um, take into this, this into account, you have Tetris on one end which is very much a, uh, a very, very towards the player end of things where you just interact with mechanics um, and then you have things like The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt uh, where you are making a lot of decisions about how the story is going to be progressing and it requires a lot more of the higher level stuff. So this is kind of a, um, a talk that I'd like to just basically in, engage uh, developers and also gamers to think about how um, the interest and benefit and potential ethical challenge of games can be maximized and also to make you think about well what is it about these sorts of games that you enjoy, um, how do you behave in games, maybe you instead of taking all the good um, routes in the next replay of the Witcher or whatever, you'll start thinking maybe you'll try something a bit different, um, or vice versa. So what I want to do uh, to do this, uh, to go through a couple of these uh, examples of uh, ethical gameplay and, and ethical games, is just give you a really, really, really brief history of morality engines a la Bioware, because it's really easy to see how they've evolved um, because BioWare has been doing this for quite a long time now. I'm not saying that these are the best, necessarily the best methods, 
Um, but I want to go through basically um, the, the, the fact that, that they've, they've evolved over time. So there's lots and lots of games in which decisions have consequences, and there are lots and lots of different mechanics and different methods to implement these different experiences. So you've got games where you can choose to be, kind of be a, uh, a good or a bad guy, like Knights of the Old Republic, Dragon Age, Fable, Mass Effect, all the Telltale games, pretty much uh, Xenoblade Chronicles, which is an interesting one. Life is Strange, The Witcher series, etc., etc., etc. And usually there's some sort of thing where you have, um, like the decisions that you make in the game have some sort of impact upon you later on. So it might be how people react to you, how um, you might change physically in some way, like you might get like darker or veiny or something scary, uh, or have like an aura or something like that. And also it usually means that there are different quests that are open to you um, if you're good or bad, so to speak. Um, so this basically, I want to go through this relatively quickly so I can get to the fun stuff. Okay, so this was the um, original Baldur's Gate series and it pretty much had a classic Dungeons and Dragons type alignment system because it was pretty much based on Dungeons and Dragons systems. And um, as people who played with me last night in the Dungeons and Dragons workshop know, it's quite easy to kind of have difficult decisions based on your alignment. Um, Anyway, but they basically have a very basic alignment um, thing, which you can see on the left, and there's also a reputation that you have, and that's basically uh, the, the big red arrow is pointing at on the right, and the reputation um, has kind of a, a, a level out, which is the number. This is the average reputation this guy has, which is 10. Evil is eight. Lawful good is, uh, sorry, chaotic evil is eight. Lawful good is 12, um, and there's sort of all the things in between. Uh, low reputation characters uh, so low reputation characters will have difficulty uh, with good non-player characters. So, for example, um, the companions may ask you to leave the part, may, may ask, may, may leave the party. Um, but you can re regain your reputation by donating money to priests, which is always a great way to like bribe your way in, I guess. I don't know. Um, and you can complete quests, which I guess is kind of a little bit more reasonable. But you lose your reputation by committing crimes and by you know, murdering people, trespassing, and stuff like that. Um, if you're really low reputation, shopkeepers won't want you in their shops, so there's a fairly good incentive to not be bad. Also, if you run around some cities, you get ambushed by guards if you're really low reputation. I guess, you know, your reputation precedes you in that case. Um, in Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic uh, and Mass Effect, I'm going to kind of put these together because they have a similar, uh, the original Mass Effects, the one and two, um, they have a similar sort of thing where you have basically good, bad. So you have light and dark or paragon, renegade, and there's kind of a gauge and you make, as you make decisions through, you uh, move up and down this gauge that shows you which side you're on. And there's a different sort of... Um, they call it, they don't call it good and evil, um, they call it different perspectives, which I think is a, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting way of going about it. But it's really just, what they're trying to say is it's really just good and evil, right? Um, so this actually is the first instance where you start to see some of these bars that are, phys that are actually showing you where you are on the scale. And this sort of allows you to then, you can manipulate it if you want in terms of how you react to different things. Um, so I've got some uh, examples there of how, the, how the, the, the light side to dark side transformation happens. You get kind of scarier looking. And then there's some of the um, examples of the, co of the sorts of decisions you can make. And what's interesting about this, these older type RPGs is that um, there's a lot of tech, because it's so text-based, there's a lot more context that you're given um, when you want to make a decision. So you get to see the whole response, not just bits of the response. And I'll get, get to that in a bit. Uh, in Mass Effect 3 and uh, Dragon Age, like the early Dragon Age, actually also all the Dragon Ages pretty much, um, these are based on kind of approval. Uh, and so it, it looks at kind of what your reputation is, how people feel about you and your party. Um, and in various different games, there are way, ways of, of in, like increasing and decreasing the approval. Uh, so for example, in Dragon Age Origins, you could give your companions gifts uh, and that would greatly improve uh, your approval rating with them. Um, and if you uh, took, your part, took a party member on a quest of some sort, your decisions that you'd make at the time would affect those 
like they would approve or disapprove the decisions that you make. So as an example there with Alistair, significantly disapproving with something that I've decided versus Sten greatly approving. So if I really want to romance Alistair, I, I better get back in his good books by giving him some gifts. Um, so that's numbered 1 to 10, uh, 1 to 100 with a guidance, so you might get a warm friendship with Sten, um, but sort of, you know, uh, love if you go all the way, so to speak. Um, this sort of comes into, they changed this up a little bit in Dragon Age 2, where they had the idea of, instead of disapproval and, and like, so friendship and, like, not friendship. <laughs> there was the idea um, uh, of friendship and rivalry, and so you could actually be, you could actually have a rival um, like love relationship with somebody. So it was it was kind of weird, but I could kind of see where that was going. But once again, it's a similar sort of thing where you get um, different sorts of response. You get you get approval from the party mates depending on what it is that you've done. Dragon Age Inquisition changed this a, a bit. Uh, quite a bit because they had no kind of gauge. There was no real easy way to find out where you stood with any of the characters in your party. Um, and they would disapprove and approve whether you took them on a quest or not. So I guess they just hear about it really quickly for the most part <laughs> um, about what you've done and they would approve or disapprove. So this is this is kind of this this is the latest of, from BioS. There's no obvious ways of seeing where you are. Um, so the bars and those numbers are really important if you want to create an ethical gameplay experience because in those older versions where you could see where you were with people, it would allow you to kind of metagame it and it would allow you to kind of make decisions um, and try to aim for certain numbers rather than just, just playing and, and making the sort of decisions you might want to play as your character. Um, uh, and so I'd like to sort of introduce Miguel Sicart's um, uh, stuff on this where he's a, a philosopher of play and he's talked about uh, a lot about video games in the past but he's now moved on so he said I could take over. <laughs> um, <laughs> But the, he said, uh, the ethical experience in these games, these particular types of games, is limited to a mere calculation of possibilities, numbers and choices that do not affect the ethical constitution of the player as an agent. So the idea of kind of metagaming it, manipulating it so that you could, you know, like if giving Alistair loads of gifts so you could romance him, for example, would be very different from real life, where if, you know, you really kind of fell out with your other half, um, you know, no matter number, no number of gifts would probably help you out there. So I'd like to just go through a little bit about what Sicard actually had to say for the rest of making ethical games. Um, and I'd like to go through this. He had a sort of a master list. Um, I'm going to produce it uh, in a way that he said it here, and then I'm going to make it a more accessible version of it towards the end as I explain um, what we're doing here. So um, he thinks that Ethical gameplay, uh, we, should, we should be creating ethically relevant game worlds. If you want to create an interesting game of any type that has sort of moral um, capacities, uh, in fact, he thinks all games should be like this, and so do I. Um, he thinks you should create an ethically get relevant game world. Don't quantize your players' actions. Let them live in a world that reacts to their values. Exploit the tension of being an ethical player. Insert other agents with constructivist capacities and possibilities. This is where we start to get a bit academic, so I'll make it a bit more accessible in a bit. And challenge the poetic cap capacities of players by expanding or constraining them. And this is um, a word I had to look up, so don't worry if you don't know it either. But it basically means the productive ca capacities. You know, what are they actually going to be getting out of this? Um, and how are they going to be building their experience within the game as an ethical agent? Because you do build your own experiences as well. Um, Okay, so uh, I'm going to be showing a lot of games now that I think kind of do what um, that I'm, I'm, I'm going to be talking about. So if you don't know these games, um, you should probably play them. And I'm going to give you a big list of games that I think you should play at the end. Uh, this is Undertale. So creating an ethically, game world, uh, an ethically relevant uh, a game world... Um, you're able to re relate to your own simulation with your own ethics um, as constructed and relevant for the game. So, for example, those choices that we looked at in Dragon Age Influent in, in, in Dragon Age <laughs> um, Inquisition represent, uh, reflect the real-world choices that you might actually have to make in, real world, in the real world if you became some sort of leader or something like that. But also, you're, you're playing the role of a leader. 
You as the player know that ethics is part of the game world, so you know that there's going to be some difficult decisions that you're going to have to make. And this is basically what that means. So when you're creating an ethically relevant game world, let players know in some way through story or, or whatever that they're going to be having to make um, decisions. Don't quantize your players' actions. Let them live in a world that reacts to their values. So I think actually in terms of the Bioware um, uh, um, RPGs that I showed you, that Dragon Age Inquisition is the closest to um, Sickart's ideal ethical gameplay system because it doesn't have, I mean, it still has some kind of numbers and you can kind of metagame it, like greatly disapproves means more than just disapproves, um, for example, and you can actually metagame it a bit, but at least it doesn't tell you exactly where um, or where you stand with each of the characters. Um, so you get those reactions, um, and you can, but you can't see how far you are along any particular approval scale. However, uh, the reactions are still quantized, and you can look them up on the Dragon Age wiki, and you can work out exactly how many times it said greatly approves to someone and what that means, and also all the ways to make people greatly approve with you. Uh, the Witcher 3, which this is a screenshot of, um, and Siri is one of my, my favorite characters, um, it's really more, it's much more subtle, and I think this is a really good example of not quantizing, because you don't get any feedback uh, at all. There's no feedback saying you did a good thing or you did a bad thing. What you get is a different story, and that's actually one of the best ways that you can actually capture that sort of ethical decision making, because it's more like what it is in real life. You don't know what would have happened if you made a different decision in real life, and you don't know when you're playing a game unless you go off and meta game it obviously and you go and look up the other endings and the other stories but let's just pretend that you're not you know you don't like spoilers and that's not what you're going to do so this is what I, this is a that's a really good example I think I'm going to have a spoiler warning for the next uh, slide for Mass Effect 3 I will tell you when you can open your eyes um, so just close your eyes if you haven't played Mass Effect 3 and you would like to and you don't want to be spoiled so in exploiting the tension of being an ethical player, and I'm sure those who have seen it know what I'm talking about now, um, I'm sure you've all played games where you've had to make some sort of really hard decision. And at this point in Mass Effect 3, I had to get out of the house and go for a walk for about half an hour before I came back and sat down and made my decision. I'm not going to tell you what it was, um, but I'm sure you've, you've had that. So each year I go to PAX East and I have a booth there where I have asked people ethical questions and I get them to answer um, uh, um, questions about what they like in games and things like that. And one of the questions I asked them was, what game gave you all the feels and why? And this was one of the biggest games that came up for that, um, as well as many other games that had very difficult decision making in them. So things like Undertale, Ma um, Mass Effect like, uh, here, Walking Dead, Life is Strange, Dragon Age, Last of Us, Witcher 3, all of these games gave people massive feels. And I think if you're a game developer, that's something you probably want to be going for is some feels of some sort, like whether that's like just really strong uh, linkage between the player and the game. It means they're really relating to the characters too, which is great. So uh, this is the most obvious sign of exploitation, which I'm going to put in little scary quotes here. I mean, because it can be used to a good, like this is a good use of exploitation. And it shows you also that you're an ethical agent because you're reacting to this stuff. You're not just playing the mechanics, you actually have a relationship with this game. Okay, if you uh, like Mass Effect 3, if you want to play Mass Effect 3, you can open your eyes again now. Um, so actually, this is, this is, I wanted to like, um, thank uh, Laurie for the talk before because he actually gave really, really good examples of inserting other agents with constructivist capacities and possibilities, which basically means have kind of social games where people talk to each other and create their own rules and create their own kind of uh, environments. Um, so, for example, um, uh, in I want to give some examples of different things where this like it can kind of work good and bad ways. But I'm all about in reinforcing the positive ways we can do this, not necessarily saying you know don't don't do that. Um, so, multiplayer games often have kind of uh, unwritten rules that are that are built up. So, I guess the Dota rule that, we, that he was talking about before is one of those. But things like, for example, if people play Ingress or uh, I guess Pokemon Go now, they haven't really been around that long yet to make that up, but it's, it's seen as very rude to drive around in Ingress rather than walking. Um, people do it anyway, but they're kind of frowned upon. Um, and also, uh, there are loads of um, 
uh, kind of etiquette things, especially in MMOs. So, for, for example, on the right-hand side, um, there's a group of um, uh, large monster raids in Final Fantasy XI, which I used to play, and there were lots of unwritten rules about large monster raids because, um, yeah, it, and, and, and they changed all the time depending on the social context and who was kind of the dominant link shell and all this sort of stuff, but it was loads of unwritten rules. Um, in World of Warcraft, there was that Serenity Now funeral thing where a bunch of griefers went in and they... they killed a whole bunch of people who were um, performing an in-game funeral for a real-life dead player. Um, and that was seen as quite rude but and griefing and stuff. And there was a lot of sort of internal um, soul-searching in the communities about that. Um, but then also things like even uh, metagaming, because um, people talk about the games they play. So they talk about even single player games with other players. And that's actually um, where you talk about p other possibilities that you could have done. Uh, that's actually a, an, an instance of social gaming that's kind of a positive social gaming thing. Um, uh, in, uh, I mean, even. Uh, I've also put up the screenshots of the um, kind of uh, ways of rating people in games and ways of actually positively interacting with people in games. So, I mean, the League of Legends kind of um, stuff on the on the left, the honourable, uh, the honour stuff was not really well received, but I think they were on the right track. And actually, um, Laurie showed some really good screenshots of what they're actually doing now um, with League of Legends. So I'm a bit behind the times with that, but oh well. But uh, <laughs> in uh, Overwatch... Uh, uh, this was my very quick game of Overwatch that I took this screenshot for and apparently I did pretty well and that made me feel really good because people liked what I did and it wasn't just um, my team that liked what I did but the other team also liked what I did and that actually makes uh, for a really, really positive gameplay experience. So you're inserting other agents within your game that actually can create positive social, um, uh, ethical, constructive unwritten rules, politeness, etiquette, all these sorts of things. These are things that we create as a human society. And it's nice to be able to see people doing that in games as well. Um, so this sort of, uh, I mean, this is really the point with this slide is that ethics enters games, can enter games that may not necessarily have uh, a whole lot of those other ethical aspects through the players themselves. This is you creating your own ethics within the society, within the game. Um, challenging the poetic capacities of players. So this is a pretty difficult thing to kind of unpack, but really what this, um, what he's trying to say here is that um, if you're going to write some sort of Rails type game where you're telling a story and that's basically what you're doing, um, challenge the people that play them. Um, you can make, um, you expand and con like basically if you if you force people to think in certain ways make it so that it's an interesting ethical experience for them get them to make difficult decisions so this is a screenshot from this war of mine where you have to kind of make a decision between you know giving someone some medicine or uh, going out and and getting some food so you can eat um, and potentially that person dying stuff like that they're very very difficult decisions that you have to make um, but it also cha it challenges people to think about what their priorities are, you know, how they feel about the different characters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are not necessarily fun games. Um, always, sometimes monsters, papers, please. There are some really good examples of these sorts of games, which really, really uh, challenge uh, players to, on, on how they think about the decisions that they make. This is another uh, really good game. Um, basically, if you haven't played Spec Ops The Line, you should totally play it. It's a really shitty game, but the story is really, really good. So put it on easy mode, because if you play any shooters at all, you will be frustrated with the mechanics. Um, but the actual, um, what they did, uh, I, I've been told basically that whoever published, like, like, whoever got this through the publishers, which is, I think, um, um, uh, I can't remember who it was, but it was a pretty big publisher, uh, certainly had balls, because if they actually knew what they were going to be publishing, they probably wouldn't have published it. Um, it's not a fun game. It's in the traditional sense. Uh, it forces you to make really tough decisions, and it forces you to confront the consequence of those decisions in quite a meaningful way. Um, but it just looks like another Call of Duty or Battlefield clone, which is why it's so subversive, because all those, you know, those Halo kids and, and Call of Duty kids would have gone out and picked this up as the next one of those, hopefully, and then they would have just had a, an experience that hopefully would have blown 
blown their mind. Um, I don't want to spoil it for you, but um, there's a quote from the game uh, which really does some fourth wall breaking, which I think is great. It says, to kill for yourself is murder, to kill for your government is, is heroic, to kill for entertainment is harmless. Um, so I've got about five minutes left, so that's really good because that's, I'm up to my almost last slide. Um, this is my version of Sicard's Accessible Ethical Game Master List, which I want to go through with you uh, as a bit of a recap of what we've just done, which was really quite a rush through of some of the uh, philosophical and kind of methods that you could get ethical experiences, the best ethical experiences out of your games. So the best ethical games are the games with ethical decisions and ethical reflective cap capability in them. So not just making decisions, but getting people to reflect upon the decisions they've made. Was it a good decision? Does it influence something else later in the game that maybe they would have missed out on if they had chosen something else, or maybe there was some other path open to them? And like this isn't just in like Knights of the Old Republic, where if you go full light, you get the full story, and if you go dark side, you kind of get about a third of the story. Um, Make sure all of the root, like, I mean, it's, it's difficult, yes, but uh, if you make sure that all of the roots or most of the roots uh, through your game have reasonable populations, and I think The Witcher 3 did this beautifully, um, it makes for a much more uh, realistic kind of ethical experience. Um, developers should get, shouldn't give players numbers and bars to help them aim for ethical or relationships or anything like that. Let the world naturally respond to your choices. Um, and I think that that's something that's becoming, I mean, the thing is, is that actually interactive fiction has been doing this for a really long time. Um, like it's classic choose your own adventure type stuff and then in, interactive fiction kind of took this on and really kind of, um, um, has built up beautiful character pictures and things like that, which I think are really good examples of some of these sort of natural responses to choices stuff. Um, but there's some really, but it's becoming more mainstream now with things like, I mean, I keep going back to The Witcher 3, but that's because it's a really good example of doing this. Um, you know, people have their own agendas, the characters have got their own agendas, it's not just centered around you as the main character, they've got their own ideas of what, how the world should be, and if you disagree with them, you can do that, but it may mean that, you know, you don't do something later on. But you don't know that at the time because it's a game. Yeah. Anyway, like real life, right? Um, uh, you should uh, make players make tough decisions that have ethical dimensions and consequences. So just put some really tough decisions in. Yeah, they're kind of hard to write, and this is why you should have good storytelling if you can uh, get good writers involved. Um, but even then, even simple things like should I, um, you know, uh, should I go out for f more food or should I go out and try to find more medicine? These are relatively simple sorts of things that you could put in. Uh, the Papers, Please one is, very, is a very good example too because it's do I let this person through and maybe get into trouble with the government because they are a wanted criminal or something like that. Um, and these are sorts of difficult decisions that you have to make um, that, and, and they have ethical consequences as well. Um, let players work out their own ethics in games, especially multiplayer type games, in a responsible social manner. So don't just let people have free-for-all stuff because you get all the griefing. This is, once again, it ties in really nicely with Laurie's talk, so thanks very much for doing that. If you didn't see Laurie's talk, have a look on the replay thing because it was really good. Um, but basically, um, the idea is that you want to build positive communities. You want to build positive um, behavioral uh, expectations within your games. And these are the sorts of, this is the sort of thing um, that helps not only uh, get people in interested in your game and play your game for longer, but also get them really hyped up for the next version of it as well. Um, but people get, like, it's build strong communities. It's really about strong communities here. Uh, for extra credit, if you're going to, if you're going to do, um, you make games that, make players question their in-game decisions by constraining or expanding players' perspectives. So if you're going to be telling a story uh, and you want to tell a really you know, good story, perhaps push someone out of their, their own shoes for a bit and, and maybe get them to experience maybe what it's like to be someone else for a bit. Um, so I know that you know, the games industry is not the most diverse industry, but it's getting better, which is great. Um, but it's really, really good to challenge players uh, to, to think about things from other people's perspectives and also then to kind of confront uh, realistic ethical and moral dilemmas within that, those sorts of perspectives, and then reflect upon those. Um, so these are some great ethical games. 
Um, I think if you're interested in games that I like to play because of they fulfill, they, don't, they may not fulfill all of the requirements. In fact, like, there's different requirements for different types of games there. Uh, obviously, you know, you shouldn't, don't need to go out and try doing all of them at once. Even if you just think about a few of them and think about what you could put into your own game, or maybe um, if you're interested, in, you know, you want to think about the sorts of games that you like to play, there may be some of those aspects that are, uh, are, are useful there. Um, I see lots of people pay, taking pictures. I'm going to put these up online, and I'll, I'll link to them uh, somehow through the wiki or something. Um, but these are basically a lot of really, really good games. Particular, I mean, uh, they're all good. They're really good. Undertale actually is the biggest one from PAX East this year. Everyone talked about Undertale and how much it the, it made. It was it was a really it's, it's a really interesting game for really, if you're interested in game mechanics as well, Undertale is really interesting because you can go through the whole game without actually fighting anyone. And I think that's really cool. Um, it's, it's just a really good game. I would recommend that one first and also Spec Ops and also all the rest of them. Um, <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for coming. Um, I've been, um, I'm Catherine Flick. Uh, here are my uh, contact details. Um, I have a, um, I have a uh, podcast where I occasionally do stuff, if you're interested in that sort of thing, where I talk about ethics and games. It's called notjustagame.eu. And um, I think we've got potentially some time for questions. So thank you. Yeah, we, we, we've got add time. Me, add me on Steam and Blizzard. <laughs> thank you. So we've, we've got time. Sorry, we've got time for probably one or two questions, uh, if anyone has any. And um, oh, yeah, we've got some over here. Then you'll be happy to take any questions afterwards, will you, as well? Yep. Thanks. So I guess this is a bit of a game design question as much as anything. Um, how do you balance the need to, or what, do you know of any good ways to balance the need to compress a lot of uh, character and relationship information into a much smaller experience than you would against the need to make interesting ethical questions within a game. So often the most difficult questions, ethical decisions in games are sort of like those that make a decision about someone else's life or someone else's well welfare. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously that requires you to build a strong bond with those people. Yeah. So are there any ways you know of or any games that really do well in compressing that experience? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I actually think this war of mine does that. Rel it allows you, like, that you kind of bond very quickly. You don't know a lot about the people, um, but you bond very quickly with them. Um, Papers, Please is another really good one. You actually, you, you have these characters that all you do is, um, all you're doing is making decisions about other people's lives and also your own family's lives, really. Um, but you have a very um, short um, window in which you kind of get to know these people. But they, they, they do it... Um, I, um, it's not it's not really really in depth. But what they do is they pick out the really important parts that you can, like, need to know, like sort of motivational stuff, stuff stuff that's very empathetic. If you can't, if you concentrate on the empathy side of things, like actually how um, how do people relate to other like I mean, it sounds kind of a bit wishy-washy, um, but I mean the the main thing is is to make sure that they seem like real people. Um, and to make sure that they're able to be empathized with in some way. And I think that's the main, I mean, if you've got some sort of link uh, to something that like seems kind of, yeah, I mean, have a, if you have a look at those two games, I think they, they do that really well in short periods of time and not a lot of writing, so, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, sorry for time, unfortunately, because that was a longish question, which is great. Uh, no problem, but um, yeah, so we're, we're going to have to end there for the moment for questions. I know there are a couple of questions, but if you have to take those later, yeah, I'll be, be out wonderful. the back. <laughs> so thank you very much, Catherine Flick. Thank you.